CataractCoach.com. Complete cataract case. We had a routine cataract case for a myopic patient. And so the question is, of course, which technique is best? So when we first start off, look how big the corneal white to white is. It fills up that fixation ring. So it's a 13 millimeter white to white. Some anesthetics being placed inside the eye, more squirted on the surface of the cornea as well. And here comes the dispersive viscoelastic. And when we do this, it's a lot of viscoelastic. We go through most of the syringe because the volume of the anterior chamber is more. And again, look at the size of the cornea compared to the fixation ring. So now pass this diamond, create a nice incision here. And there it is entering the anterior chamber. That looks great. Now these myopic guys, of course, are, our issues are a refractive outcome for the patient. The patient does not want to end up hyperopic. I'll tell you that for sure. And a very myopic patient erring on the side of myopia is actually a good thing. So here's creating the capsular axis. Notice we're measuring with those forceps to make sure we have a nice five millimeter rexus so we can overlap the optic. Don't make the mistake of an overly large capsular axis. There it is, measured to be exactly five. You don't want to guess the rexus size by the amount of pupil dilation because remember these big myopic guys, it's quite a bit dilation. Now, hydrodissection being done nice and easy in all quadrants, getting that good fluid wave across. In these eyes, sometimes we can end up with that reverse pupillary block or that lens iris diaphragm retropulsion syndrome. So we'll rotate the nucleus, a little more viscoelastic to protect the central cornea, and we're gonna chop this right in the capsular bag. So infusion goes inside there. Let's see what happens. The iris looks okay, it doesn't look too bad. So we'll buzz in with the FACO probe, pass the chopper, let's split that nucleus into halves, spread those apart, and then we can bring up each half. Notice how I use the chopper to hold one piece back to create a little bit more room so we can get that other hemi-nuclear piece up, and then we can also sub-chop it and remove it. We want to avoid having these eyes become depressurized or flattening out the anterior chamber. That barrow trauma or pressure trauma can induce some pressure on the vitreous base, which is, of course, there at the retinal periphery, and you may end up with breaks in the retina. These myopic patients, of course, they're at a risk for a retinal break or detachment in the post-op period, even with a perfect surgery. Remember, we're taking out a four millimeter thick human lens, the cataract, and replacing it with a very thin, less than one millimeter thin man-made lens. So you're going to definitely have shifting of the vitreous in the post-op period. That's to be expected. So these patients in the post-op period want to check their retinas to be sure. Now, cortex removal coming up next. Again, there's not much in terms of um, reverse pupillary block or the lens iris diaphragm retropulsion syndrome. So that's pretty fortunate in this case. And if that does happen, what's the treatment? Of course, it's just tenting up the iris temporarily to equilibrate the pressure between the anterior chamber and posterior chamber. Not a vitreous cavity, but anterior chamber, posterior chamber. So cleaning up the lens cortex, polish the capsular bag a little bit. Also be cognizant that these patients can have a thinner capsule. Now there's a little mucus strand on the surface of the eye, so we'll wipe that off in a minute or have our scrub tech squirt the eye. But that's that line that you see coming across the cornea right now. There is a good squirt, that's very helpful. So cleaning this up again, we don't want to have a broken capsule in these cases because a break in the posterior capsule will put this patient at a very high risk, comparatively speaking, for a retinal attachment. So there's the capsular bag. Let's fill it up with our cohesive viscoelastic. That looks great. There's that round rexus. We can polish the capsule a little bit more after we get the IO on the bag. So here comes the lens. Let's get this thing delivered. And we still have a single piece acrylic lens which should go in the capsule bag nicely. Now, this particular model of single piece acrylic lens is available in powers as low as 6.0 diopters, which would probably be sufficient for someone who's in the low teens in terms of total myopia in the pre-op exam. So there's that rexus edge, nice overlap there on top of the optic. So we'll go here, lift up the lens, go behind the optic, remove that viscoelastic, 
and we're gonna finish this case up. So fun to watch a case that's complete start to finish, a lot of good pearls that you can pick up, and you can see the flow of the surgery. Again, here's more polishing of the undersurface of the anterior capsular rim, and we'll get that looking just right. Also notice the incisions there, we've barely nicked the limbo vessels, so that's going to allow great long-term sealing and healing and stability. He, uh, hydrating up the incisions there, we'll go inside, let's do an angle sweep, make sure there's no retained viscoelastic. Also keep in mind, these patients tend to be more likely to have a steroid response in the post op period in terms of intraocular pressure spike, so we definitely don't want to have any retained viscoelastic. There's a little bit of triamcinolone, which will stay in the anterior chamber just for a couple of days. We'll swirl that around with some BSS and then finally finish up here with a small aliquot of moxifloxacin as an antibiotic. There's the lens power, 11.5 Dobber, so not terribly myopic. And then uh, we'll check the incisions. Here's the moxifloxacin. That's a beautiful case. And the patient, I can tell you, was happy the next day.